Shalom, and welcome to our show, The Crossover, a show aimed at bridging gaps between Jews and Christians. Today's subject is on the rescuers and the rescued from the Holocaust. It's part of our series of Never Forget. We are honored to have such a distinguished guest today, Dr. Michael Bar Zohar. He is the author of Beyond Hitler's Grasp, and it's about the 50,000 Bulgarian Jews that were never touched in Bulgaria when Bulgaria actually was an ally of Hitler. For the first time in the history of publishing, a documentary and full-length feature film will be made simultaneously from this book. Dr. Michael Bar Zohar has appeared on CNN, ABC, Larry King Live, Nightline, and C-SPAN. He's an internationally noted historian, news correspondent, and university professor with over 30 books to his credit. His best-selling book, Suez Top Secret, won the Israeli equivalent of the American Pulitzer Prize, the Sokolov Prize. He's born in Bulgaria and he emigrated to Israel in 1948. Dr. Michael Bar Zohar is also the official biographer, of the founder of Israel, First Prime Minister David Ben Gurion. He was media and communications advisor for Moshe Dayan, as well as a former member of the Israeli Knesset. He has a PhD in political science and international relations and was knighted in France. Here's Mitch and Dr. Michael Bar Zohar. Dr. Bar Zohar. Excuse me. Thank you very much for coming and joining us on the program. Thank you, Mitch. It's a pleasure. Uh, let's start off here with the, uh, the, the aim of our, the crossover program is to bridge a gap between Jews and Christians. And, and I know every so often you're at Emory University in, in Georgia teaching a, a course. And one of those courses happened to be on uh, rescue and rescuers from the Holocaust. And um, why is this an important course to be teaching today? And um, how can that help bridge the gaps between the the Jews and the Christians? Uh, first of all, because uh, people look at the Holocaust as something terrible, something dark in which you have no ray of hope. And I believe that if we teach them about the people who risk their lives to save uh, other human beings, to save Jews in this uh, story, uh, that gives uh, a ray of a beacon of light into this dark story of the Holocaust. It bridges the gap because who were the people who saved Jews? They were Christians. Christians, they were not Jews. The Jews were running away for their lives. Right. So you have people like Schindler, uh, have people uh, who carried out operation like in Denmark or like in Bulgaria. Uh, you have all these nuns and priests in Italy who did a tremendous job of saving people in spite of the fact that the Pope at the time was not exactly the one who was ready to help the Jewish people. Uh, you see that there was a vast group of people, a vast uh, mass of people Throughout. who were ready to take a lot of risks to serve, to they save sure the did. Jewish they brothers. their lives to do that. Now, Dr. Barzohar, here's a book that we'll hold up for the cameras. And this is, um, I know you've written over 30 books. Uh, what, here's a book called Beyond Hitler's Grasp. And I want to spend some time with you sharing with us on this the story of the Bulgarian rescue there were approximately 50,000 Jews in Bulgaria, and um, here was a country that seemed to be, a, what was different about this country uh, with the Nazi occupation versus other European countries? Well, first of all, they were allies of the Nazis. They were not an occupied country, they were an allied country. They were a member of the uh, tripartite pact with Germany, Italy, and Japan. Uh, they supported Germany. Uh, they policed for Germany several parts of uh, southeastern Europe. The king, Boris, was a close personal friend of Adolf Hitler. So they had a Nazi government? A pro-Nazi government, yes. A pro-fascist majority in parliament. The press was very pro-fascist pro and they supported Germany wholeheartedly. Now, the Jews in Bulgaria, the second, uh, would say, peculiarity was that the Jews were not hated. There was almost no anti-Semitism in Bulgaria. Uh, Why? How did that? There are several reasons. First of all, the Bulgarian people were always very, very tolerant of different ethnic groups. The second point was that Bulgaria was under Turkish occupation, under Turkish rule 
for five centuries, 500 years. And under the Turkish rule, they were all the same. Bulgarians, gypsies, Jews, uh, G Greeks, uh, all kind of nations and ethnic group, ethnic groups. So which there was were a lot there. of toleration, okay. and they were the same. They were the same, facing the ruler, the occupier, and they were the same, dreaming of, of independence. Now, the Bulgarian Jews, on the other hand, were not very religious. They did not look different because they were not dressed differently. Um, I can give an example. I never saw a Jew with a beard or with side locks or even with, with, a, with a skull cap. So does that mean ultra-Orthodox weren't there or they just no, dressed as Orthodox? No, there were no ultra-Orthodox. Uh -huh. uh, even the Orthodox were <laughs> not exactly very Orthodox. Okay. The Bulgarian Jews were terrible. They said there are, there are four kinds of Jews in the world. There are the Orthodox, the Reform, the Conservative, and the Bulgarian. <laughs> and the Bulgarian are the worst, <laughs> unfortunately. But anyway, they were very deeply, um, I would say, absorbed and integrated into Bulgarian society. Okay. They volunteered for the Bulgarian wars. Many of them were heroes, war heroes, or so wounded they or assimilated fallen. assimilated into the society. Very much accepted. assimilated and very much accepted by the Bulgarian society. So how did, then here's King Boris, is that who his name That's was? That's okay. yes. And he was getting edicts, uh, you know, from Hitler to annihilate, exterminate the Jewish people, which were 50,000. And why don't you tell us a story here? I'm reading in the book here, it said that two times the trains arrived in Bulgaria to transport the Jews to the death camps. They knew That's exactly correct. where they were going to go. And not one Jew got on that train. Two times they yes, came. Two, two times, times the operation right. was called off. The first time was the 9th of March, 1943, when... Uh, that was the time when about 8,000 Bulgarian Jews were supposed to go that day to be sent to the death camp in Treblinka to extermination. And they were ordered to be at the, the train stations with 20 kilo of, uh, of uh, personal possessions. And everybody knew they were going to their death. And they tried to intervene and to, to make the, their Bulgarian friends help them. And indeed, that day, there was a mini revolt in parliament where the uh, many members of the pro-fascist majority burst into the office of the interior minister and told him, we're not going to allow to send our Jews to Poland. They're our people, they're our friends, they're our brothers. We're not going to do that. At the same time, the church intervened very strongly with the king. And they said, you don't touch our Jewish brothers. And, and now this is interesting so. because uh, if I if I understood this because other trains had passed through Bulgaria to the death camps it That's says correct. here from Thrace and Thrace Macedonia, and Macedonia yes. that in other words these were trains that had Jewish people on oh, them definitely. they went right through Bulgaria the Bulgarians delivered the Jews from Thrace and Macedonia uh -huh. to the Nazis and uh, because this these were regions which were Outside policed and administered by Bulgaria, but they were not part of Bulgaria proper. But when time came to take the Bulgarian Jews themselves, the Bulgarians said no. And finally, the king canceled the deportation order two hours before the departure. On the 9th of March, 1943, the trains left empty. So the Nazis and, the, and their Bulgarian supporters tried again. In uh, May of 1943, two months later, on the 24th of May, they tried again to send the Jews to the camps. And this time, they wanted to send all the 50,000 Jews straight to Poland. They even brought barges and boats to the Bulgarian ports on the Danube River in order to take them to Vienna and from there to Poland. Okay. And uh, two days before the departure, the Minister of Interior went to the king to get his agreement. And once again, the king said, no way, not even one Jew will leave Bulgaria. So they finally, at the last moment, had to cancel the order. They deported the Jews of the capital of Sofia to the small cities in the provinces where they lived with other Jewish families. But not even one Jew was uh, sent across the border. So when the war ended, it turned out that Bulgaria was the only country in the Nazi sphere of interest uh, in which the Jews had 
grown in number because of natural amazing. growth. Yeah. That was the only place. Yeah, and the fantastic miracle. thing was that among those who supported the efforts to save the Jews were some among the most virulent pro-Nazi leaders in the Bulgarian parliament. And when asked why are they doing it, they said, well, we admire Hitler, we admire Germany, we admire Nazi Germany, it's our ally, but don't touch our Jews. Wow. That was the final and Bulgaria reaction. was the only country, the only country, not one Jew, who was yes. uh, persecuted or died. Definitely. How come this rescue was not publicized? You know, we heard about Schindler, movies have been made, uh, the Italian rescue and the Danish rescue, but this one... Nothing heard of yes, until that was this the book. Best, the best kept secret of the it, Second it, someone, World War. They were waiting for you to write the book. Well, it was very funny, but you know, um, the main reason is that the Jews of Bulgaria were saved by three main factors. The uh, pro-fascist majority in parliament, which means the Nazis, right. the church, and the king. Now, after the war, Bulgaria was liberated by the Soviet Union, became a communist country. Who are the three worst enemies of communism? Nazis, church, church. and king. king. So the Bulgarians said, were in trouble. How could they explain and describe this rescue without giving credit <laughs> to their worst enemies? Therefore, mm -hmm. they decided what the French called to drown the fish, to tell a lot of stories around it, to say, yes, they were saved by the Bulgarian people by the Bulgarian Communist Party, which was in illegality at this time, they couldn't do nothing. Right. And they tried not to publish, publicize too much this story because they would have to tell, would have had to tell the real story. Exactly. So for many years, they did not publish it. We were very lucky that they did not destroy the documents about the rescue. The Bulgarians had wonderful archives and they were locked and sealed, but not destroyed. So I came there after the collapse of communism, when they started becoming a free country, and I could finally get into the archives and find the documents about this fantastic story and s interview some of the survivors who were still there, people who had helped mm -hmm. or people who had been saved. And that was a very interesting uh, research. This, this book now has become a documentary. And in fact, uh, just recently at the United Nations, or it was its premier in the United States, was through the United Nations in New York. And, and then uh, just yesterday you were saying in uh, uh, Switzerland at the United Nations in Geneva was the premier in Europe for the viewing of the documentary. And soon to be a full length movie and never has a book been a documentary and a movie before. Congratulations there, huh? So you're about to see something that's really uh, Quite gripping. Enjoy. Dr. Barzohar, when people watch this uh, documentary and eventually the film that will be produced, uh, what is it that you hope the viewers walk away with after seeing this documentary? The main point is that uh, it was possible to say no to Hitler. That's the lesson we are drawing from all the efforts to rescue Jews and most from the Bulgarian example, but not only from the Bulgarian example. We know that in all the cases when people tried to say no to the Germans and 
save Jews, they succeeded. Hmm. The Italians until 1943, when they were conquered by Germany, they succeeded to save many, many thousands of Jews, their own Jews and Jews from the other countries, from Croatia, from Serbia, from France, from the Greek islands. And uh, we know very well that even in Berlin, many Jews had been saved by local German friends. And when the Germans who rescued Jews were captured, nothing was done to them. Nothing was done to them. Which means that finally, if people were a little bit more caring, they could have saved many hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of Jews. Hmm. When you were a young child, uh, at what age did you actually go to Israel? At the age of Immigrate, 10. Age of 10. Uh, 40. So Bulgaria was a, a safe country. It was a good country. It was a beautiful country to you, your family. Your yes. father was a doctor, I think. Yes. And one day you had that you were 10, you leave Bulgaria to go to Israel. Now, Bulgaria was so good to you. Why, why did you leave, oh. uproot, and, and go to a... Uh, the Bulgarian a Jewish man. community was the most Zionist community in, in Europe. We all dreamt of going back to Israel and uh, building our own state. That had nothing to do with the fact that we felt very, very welcome in Bulgaria. And I remember that when we left, many... Many of my father's patients came to his uh, clinic and they were very deeply offended and insulted. They said to him, doctor, why are you leaving? And my father would say, we want to have our own country. And they would say, but this is your country. What's wrong with your country, with, with our country? Right. And that was really a problem. We left and I remember that when we left on the border, people stood and wept because they were leaving a beloved country, which was Bulgaria. And they kept visiting Bulgaria af afterwards almost every year to show the Bulgarians their gratitude, to meet their friends. Yeah. And uh, this was a country which we did not leave because it was not, because we wanted to escape or it was not good yeah. to us on the contrary. It was just because the Bulgarian Jews in a very candid and perhaps even naive way dreamt of being, having a state of their own. So, Dr. Barzohar, then in response to that, when in your book I, I was reading here is when you were young and I guess 10, 12, and you would be around other children, you're now in Israel, and um, other kids would say that they were refugees. And you, would, you said here that sometimes you would respond with anger, outbursts, and a fist fight. I am not a refugee, I am an immigrant. That's correct. And I did not, could not stand the fact that they were calling me a refugee. I, I did not escape from anything. I had nothing to run away from. Mm -hmm. uh, we left from our you own free will. You knew this was your land to Yes, be. we left out of own, our own free will. We could mm. have stayed and enjoyed Bulgaria the same way. Mm. And we immigrated because of our will to do that. What about today? We have a lot of immigration into Israel from Russia and Africa and different yes. places around. And I guess a lot of that is refugee situations. I mean, they are, they are happy to get out of a country that even though communism has fallen, but still the oppression, repression there. How is Israel handling the swell of the immigr immigrants coming in there economically, and how are they, a lot of these people are coming in with nothing, and how? Well, you see, first of all, Israel's uh, right of existence, Israel's raison d'etre, is accepting and absorbing refugees and bringing Jews from all over the world. So the state was created in order to bring Jews from all over the world. Exactly and right. we have to give them a lot of, uh, lot of things like new, new homes and new professions and free social security and uh, free health care, free education for the children, free training, a free school of Hebrew for a year, a lump sum to subsist the first two years. It's, a lot of, it's very expensive. And we get a lot of support from abroad. But it's very successful. Because, you see, the Russian Jews, for instance, started coming about 10 years ago to Israel. And today, the average Russian Jew lives like the average Israeli who's been there for 50 years, really? which means the same standard of living. And uh, I believe that uh, the day immigration stops, the state of Israel will be in a bad shape. Mm. We still need a lot of immigrants. And in the last 10 years, we had the Russian immigration, which is very interesting. That was the first non-Zionist immigration to Israel. People who didn't want Wasn't especially to go to Israel. They want to go to America, actually. They okay. want to go to the United States. But there was a quota. 
So they came to Israel. <laughs> and they loved the country and the state. And we have had very little people, very few people, who decided to leave the country and uh, look for their fortune abroad. What, uh, I know you go around the country and, and, and are a spokesperson for Israeli bonds. And um, yes. it sounds like this would be a good place for you to maybe uh, speak about. Why would, wh how could Americans help uh, Israel? What, would it be, what, what does it mean to buy an Israeli bond? What well, there are all mean? kinds of ways. First of all, there, there, is the, there is the United Jewish Appeal, which are people are contributing money to all kinds of goals. And among them is helping Israel. The Israel bonds is, 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 a, is a kind of, of loan that Israel is taking from uh, people in this country. And it started in 1952, already 50 years ago. And uh, Israel uh, has never defaulted in paying its debt. And today we have as much money, which comes, even more money, which comes from non Jews than from Jewish people because Isn't that interesting? banks and states and pension funds and uh, unions are very interested in investing in Israel. And they know their money is safe and they're doing something very good because. For instance, to bring all these immigrants to, to Israel and to give them a new life, it's a fantastic achievement. And we are doing it with the help of people all over the world. It's great to hear it's coming from all the institutions, too. Yes. Do you think the Jewish people here in America are just more not in tune with what's happening over there in Israel? They're not as supportive financially? Well, uh, they Mitch, feel distant? There, there, first of all, there were two generations. There is a generation which was here when the State of Israel was created, an older generation. And they were very much involved because for them, the creation of the Jewish state was like a dream come true. For a younger generation, they've been born, the state of Israel has always existed. For them, it's not such a thrilling thing that there is a Jewish state. Uh -huh. That's the world in which they were born. So, of course, the, the, the motivation is less strong and they want also to, to give much more for local needs than their parents who were able to give everything they had to, for Israel. First of all, Israel today doesn't need that much money. Israel can survive by its own toil and work. And we, we are much more interested in, in this money as a kind of tie between people in this country and in Israel. Because when you contribute or invest money, you want us to know what is done with your money. Right. You're much more connected than just being a kind of, of mildly interested spectator. So, but t today we are speaking about the period before 9-11. After 9-11, there is a tremendous care and, uh, and interest among the Jewish population and among the non-Jewish population in Israel and what's happening there. Yes. And people are telling us for the first time, now we understand what you've been going through because we start to feel exactly. what you're feeling there. Through that tragedy, we're drawn closer. Well, Dr. Barzohar, we have about 30 seconds, and I uh, just want you to have the last 30 seconds here and just speak to our viewers of... Just what's on your heart? What do you want them to know before you uh, sign off? And what's important for us to hear in this time, in this age? Well, uh, I think very frankly, without trying to offend anybody, that the creation of the State of Israel was finally the most, and most uplifting and important event of the 20th century. We saw communism rising and falling. We saw Nazism rising and falling. We saw the Cold War. We saw many new states being created, and most of them failing, in, 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 unable to, to live in democracy and freedom. And I think that the return of the Jewish people to its homeland, it's a dramatic thing which was carried out not only by the Jews, but with the help of many friends throughout the world, Jews and Christian alike. And we feel, I feel very fortunate to live in this period and to be able to be a part of this dramatic event which will... It's exciting. It's prophecy yes. coming true, too. That's correct. Well, we're out of time. We sure appreciate your time again, Dr. Thank Marzola. you, Mitch. Thank you. For those of you who might be interested in acquiring any of Dr. Michael Barzohar's books, especially The Beyond Hitler's Gra Grasp, you can get it at local bookstores, and if you can't find it there, just have them order it for you. It just came out in a paperback. Also, if you would like to invite him to speak at your civic organization or your church or synagogue, you can contact him at Michael, M-I-C-H-E-L, bar at AOL.com. Also, he was mentioning Israeli bonds, and for those of you who would like to invest and help Israel, the number to reach for that is 1-800-676-3101.